our subject this evening is elementary principles and our text is Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 to 3 and we are reading from the English Standard Version. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Let us pray. O oh, dearest Lord, thy sacred head with thorns was pierced for me. O oh, pour thy blessing on my head that I may think of thee. O oh, dearest Lord, thy sacred hands with nails were pierced for me. O oh, shed thy blessing on my hands that they may work for thee. O oh, dearest Lord, thy sacred feet with nails were pierced for me. O oh, pour thy blessing on my feet, that they may follow thee. O oh, dearest Lord, thy sacred heart with spear was pierced for me. O oh, pour thy spirit in my heart, that I may live for thee. Lord God, help us this evening as we study your word what we know not teach us what we are not make us for the sake of your son our Lord Amen. Galatians chapter 4 uh, is the beginning of the second half of Paul's letter to the Galatians. There are six chapters, but he's still continuing his argument from chapter 3. Warren Wearsby, who was once the president of the Back to the Bible radio broadcast, in his introduction to Galatians chapter 4, makes the following remarks, and I quote, one of the tragedies of legalism is that it gives the appearance of spiritual maturity when in reality it leads the believer back into a second childhood of Christian experience. The Galatian Christians, like most believers, wanted to grow and go forward for Christ, but they were going about it in the wrong way. Their experience is not too different from that of Christians today who get involved in various legalistic movements, hoping to become better Christians. Their motives may be right, but their methods are wrong. This is the truth 
Paul is trying to get across to his beloved converts in Galatia. The Judaizers had bewitched them into thinking that the law would make them better Christians. Their old nature felt an attraction for the law because the law enabled them to do things and measure external results. As they measured themselves and their achievements, they felt a sense of accomplishment and, no doubt, a little bit of pride. Um, Wearsby says, a little bit of pride. I want to perhaps disagree with him and say, a lot of pride. They thought they were going forward when actually they were regressing. In this section of his letter, Paul expands on his analogy in verses 24 to 26 of the previous chapter of a child coming of age. He contrasts the lives of believers before they were saved with their lives after they were saved. He compares them before they are saved to children and servants. And he compares them to adults and sons after they are saved. Both his Jewish and Gentile readers in Galatia would have understood this imagery since the Jews, Greeks, and Romans all had ceremonies to mark a child's coming of age. In verses 1 and 2, he writes, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In order to illustrate the spiritual immaturity of those who live under the Mosaic law or any other system of rule keeping, Paul informs the Galatian believers of certain characteristics of an ear as a minor child in contrast with an adult son. He explains that even though the ear may be the owner of an entire estate by virtue of his birthright, as a child he is nevertheless in a subservient condition in that he enjoys no freedom and can make no decisions. In fact, as a child, the ear is under guardians and managers. This is true until he comes of age as a son. And later on, perhaps, Next week or the following week, we will look at the whole matter of adoption as it relates to Christianity. I am sure that you have passed uh, signs at the front of business places, maybe that would say, Walker and Sons. You never see Walker and children. Children can't help in operating a business. They can't be partners. It is when they attain to 
maturity and become adult sons that they become partners in a business. The word child in verse 1, Paul says, I mean that the heir as long as he is a child. That word child is a translation of the Greek word napios, which literally means one that does not speak. One that does not speak. A child. That should tell us all we need to know right there. It refers to a small child above the age of a helpless infant, but probably not more than three or four years of age. Figuratively, Napius refers to a person who lacks experience, is untried, ignorant, are simple-minded. The word refers to an immature person intellectually and morally. Paul says that's what we were. We were all like that when we were not saved. One of the one of the one of the uh, situations that we have to deal with brethren is when we live like this even after we are saved and that's something that we have to grapple with this evening are we who are actually in the position of adult sons still living like little children Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Now they were not infants in Christ, but Paul says, I have to speak to you as if you were infants. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? The word infants in verse 1 is a translation of the Greek word napios, children. Children, one that does not speak. Paul is saying, I can't deal with you even as persons who are mature Christians. I almost have to deal with you as if you were still unsaved. Now, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Paul says, I have to be feeding you with milk. Now, something is wrong with a six-year-old child still being nourished by breast milk. That would be an anomaly. That is not a sight that I would like to see, a six-year-old on the breast. But is it possible that some of us in a spiritual sense, could be like that. That would be tragic, eh? How does Paul know that they are still infants? He says, for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh? 
and behaving only in a human way. That's how children behave. The word is also used in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13. The writer says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Again, the word child is a translation of napios, one who does not speak. Lacks experience, untried, ignorant, simple-minded. Paul says, unskilled in the word of righteousness. How will we become skilled in the word of righteousness? By listening to the word as it is expounded, as it is rightly divided, by reading the word, by asking God to illuminate our understanding, and by living out the word, That is how we become adults in a practical sense. Paul uses this word, napios, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 1 to describe the person who is under the law. He or she is treated as an immature person. An adult, for instance, is old enough to govern his or her own actions. A child must have restraints put upon him or her. Isn't it so? Huh? You put children in a crib as they get older you maybe transfer them to a playpen with restraints and you know that when you are getting back young you have to be put under restraints again when you're getting young again, once a man and twice a child, when you becoming a child for the second time, you have to be restrained again. Paul says he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. This is also the case in the spiritual world. Israel under the law was treated like a minor, not as an adult. In verses 22 to 23 of chapter 3, some of you may remember, Paul described the law as a jailer, which kept all in custody. In verses 24 to 25, he personified the law as a paedagogos, a legally appointed overseer authorized to train up a child. Now, in chapter 4 and verse 1, he changes the metaphor to guardians and managers. Under Roman law, Boys, from their birth to the age of 14, were under the charge of legal guardians. And then from the age of 14 to the age of 25, their property was administered by managers. The guardian was the overseer of the child's person, while the manager was the overseer of the child's property. 
However, Roman law did give Roman fathers some discretion in setting the time of their son's transition from boyhood to manhood. This sets the stage for Paul's statement in Galatians 4.4 4, that God the Father chose the time that his son would bring his people into maturity. And we'll probably look at that next week. Paul says he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. The word until is time sensitive. It specifies that something happens or something is in place until an appointed time. When the appointed time arrives, there is a cessation of whatever was happening or whatever was in place during the period before the appointed time. In this context, what ceases is the subjection of the child to the guardians and managers. When the date set by the father comes and the boy, who is now an adult, um, goes through that ceremony that recognizes him as an adult son. That son is no longer under a guardian or a manager. I want us to think about that. Even though this boy is the legal owner by birthright of this vast property, the slave who is entrusted to care for him, has authority over him. He's the heir, you know, but he's under a slave. And Paul is saying, before we were saved, that is what our condition was. My concern is not so much what was happening before we were saved. My concern is that now that we are saved and the moment, the moment that we are saved, we become adult sons. The moment we are saved, we become adult sons. My concern is if we are living under a system of law, under a system of rules and regulations, we are still acting as if we were children under a slave. The words, the date set, until the date set by his father, the words, the date set, are the translation of a Greek word which was a legal term among the Athenians referring to an appointed time for the termination of the minority. This time was set by the father of the child. It was the father who determined when the child was no longer subject to guardians and managers. Under Roman law, the age of maturity for a child was set by his father and involved a ceremonial putting on of the toga virilis and his formal acknowledgement as the son and heir. The toga virilis was a distinctive garment of ancient Rome that symbolized manhood. It was a roughly semicircular cloth between 12 and 20 feet in length, draped over the shoulders and around the body. It was usually woven from white wool and was worn over a tunic. And if you have watched movies or shows of ancient Rome like Gladiator, you would see the senators dressed in that toga kind of loosely hung over their bodies. 
Paul uses this analogy in reference to the condition of believers prior to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. This intervention took place when the fullness of time had come. And like I said, we'll look at that next week, Lord willing. In verse 3, he writes, In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. The elementary principles of the world. Our subject this evening is elementary principles. The word children is a translation of the same Greek word napios, which was translated child in verse 1. As we stated earlier, the word is used figuratively to refer to a person who lacks experience, a person who is untried, a person who is ignorant or simple-minded. We said the word refers to an immature person, immature intellectually and morally. Paul says we were children. Who is the we that he refers to? He says, in the same way, we also, when we were children. Who is the we that he refers to? He's probably referring to both the Jews and the Gentiles in the Galatian church. He's informing them that before they were saved, they were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. He includes himself. We, because he, like them, had been a slave to the same principles before he was saved. The Greek word translated enslaved is in the perfect tense, indicating that this is the continuous state of every human being in Adam before their salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, places them in Christ as a result of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that is the condition of all unsaved men and women. They are slaves. That is their fixed state. There is no change to that state unless Christ intervenes. Now, let's look at the phrase, elementary principles. It's an interesting phrase. We have to spend a little time on it. It's the translation of the Greek word stoikion. Stoikion. Now, Thayer's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament furnishes the following meaning of the word, and I quote, the word denotes specifically one, the letters of the alphabet as the elements of speech. So we could say the ABCs, stoichion, the elementary principles. What's the first thing you learn in school? The ABCs, the elementary principles. Two, the elements from which all things have come the material causes of the universe. That was including in the meaning of the word as far as the Greeks were concerned. Of course, the Greeks did not believe that it was God who spoke the world into existence. They believed that there was there, there were certain materials from which the world was brought about. And so they, 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 this was included in their meaning of elementary principles. The first causes of the earth coming into being. Three, the heavenly bodies, either as parts of the heavens or as other things, because in them the elements of man's life and destiny were supposed to reside. So people thought that the sun and the moon 
actually, and the stars actually had some role in determining how persons behaved. You know what is the Spanish word for moon? Huh? La luna. You know what is a lunatic? A lunatic is, of course, a mad person, mentally unstable. Comes from that word. So they, they thought that it was the moon that affected persons. Tied to this third one here, brethren, the heavenly bodies, this elementary principles, was that uh, men and women worship the sun and the moon as gods and the stars. For the element, rudiment, primary and fundamental principles compared to our alphabet or ABC. Whenever you see that little abbreviation CF, it really is an abbreviation of comparison. So, so the elements, rudiments, primary and fundamental principles of any art, any science or discipline, the rudiments with which mankind were indoctrinated before the time of Christ, that is the elements of religion, training or, or religion or the ceremonial precepts common alike to the worship of Jews and of Gentiles. Paul says we were enslaved to these things. Poikion describes something orderly in arrangement as for example of things in a row and hence an element. In most of its uses, it denotes an elementary or fundamental principle in a subject or discipline. It refers to the first principles of something. For example, the basics or fundamentals of Christianity. In some churches that persons go to, they never move from preaching the same thing every Sunday. You hear the same thing every Sunday. And in fact, in certain churches, um, certain books of the Bible are preached on almost all the time. And some are avoided. I found this comment that I read in the Jewish New Testament very interesting, and perhaps it is somewhat controversial. And I quote, element, it's, 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 it's commenting on the phrase element, elementary principles. It says, elemental spirits of the universe. We, both Jews and Gentiles, were slaves to them. Gentiles serve these demonic spirits as gods. That's how this Jewish New Testament commentary describes elementary principles. Jews, though knowing the true God, were sometimes led astray by demonic spirits, including the demonic spirit of legalism. It's interesting. That's interesting to think that legalism is promoted by demonic spirits. Have you ever thought of that? Jews served the spirit, the spirit whenever they perverted the Torah into a legalistic system. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. And here's a 
Jewish New Testament commentary saying that Jews served this demonic spirit whenever they perverted the Torah into a legalistic system. Would that be true of us when we pervert the Bible into a legalistic system? Would we be following demonic spirits? It's an interesting thought. I wouldn't push it too far, but I wouldn't. I, 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 I would never deny that that has something to do with it. In, a, in, in, in terms of education in this country, I don't know if you recognize how badly we have slipped, you know. In the era in which I was born, and certainly before that, any child who received an elementary education in Jamaica could function in life for the rest of his or her life very adequately. And now children are graduating from primary school who cannot read and write. That was unheard of in Jamaica in an elementary school. It was impossible. Impossible. It never happened. Children are going to high school who are illiterate. They are just passed up the system because we want to, we want to give the impression that they are at a high school. We have changed the names, you know, you don't have no secondary school again. Every school is a high school, and we have this wonderful structure and everybody's going to high school and they're going to high school and they cannot read and write graduating from primary school and they cannot read and write and we think that we are making progress anyhow that's not a part of the lesson that's just me griping when i think about the country that i grew up in and the country that I am now living in. Let me just say to, since I'm on that topic, let me just say to those of us who should know better but don't know better, and those of us who might not know better, getting rid of the monarchy it's not going to make life any better for those of us who live in this country. I have no great love for the monarchy. Anybody who knows John Mark Bartlett would know that. If you really know the real John Mark Bartlett, you would know that I don't have any great love for the monarchy. And some of you who say you don't love the monarchy, I'm amazed that Jamaicans, you know, who say... Uh, we must get rid of the monarchy. But they get up early in the morning and watch the marriages of these royal people. But let us get rid of them. But we find their marriages fascinating. The Americans who got rid of the monarchy 300 years ago are fascinated by the monarchy today. They still want a king and a queen, you know. They just are ornery. It's not going to change anything in this country. Trust me on that. We think that just a change from being under the monarchy is going to bring in the promised land. Don't believe it. Get back on track, Bartlett. the elementary principles of the world. The Greek word translated world is cosmos. The basic meaning of the word was order. It was used to refer to the universe. The Greeks referred to the universe as the cosmos. Why? 
from the fact of its perfectly ordered arrangement. They looked at how the universe operated and they said, what order, what perfect order. And that word was cosmos. It also meant an ornament, decoration, dress, especially of women. Cosmos was also used to refer to the inhabitants of the earth. Kenneth Wiest comments that, and I quote, the word cosmos is used to refer to the world system, wicked and alienated from God, yet cultured, educated, powerful, outwardly moral at times. The system of which Satan is the head, the fallen angels are his servants, and all mankind, other than the saved, are his subjects. The vast majority of the time that Paul uses that word world, cosmos, this is what he means. The world system that is governed by Satan, a system in which God is alienated. This includes those people, pursuits, pleasures, purposes, and places where God is not wanted. So right away, this definition helps us to see if we are worldly, whether we are saved or not. It refers also to the human race, fallen, totally depraved. It may have reference to the created universe. It may also refer simply to mankind without any particular reference to man's fallen and wicked condition. As Paul uses the word here, the phrase here, the elementary principles of the world probably refers to the first principles of non-Christian humanity. In the case of the Jew, it is a reference to the symbolic and ceremonial character of Judaism and its legal enactments. And in the case of the Gentiles, it is a reference to the ceremonial and ritualistic observances of the pagan religions. So that would include a vast array of things. So for the Jew, it would represent the whole system of Judaism a Judaism without Christ as its center, a Judaism that did not point to Christ, where the sacrifices and the ceremonies were an end in themselves. That is what Judaism had come to by the time Jesus came into the world. It was a backslidden apostate, not even it was an apostate religion where the ceremonies, the keeping of the Sabbath, the offering of sacrifices were an end in themselves. In other words, this is how we become righteous, not by understanding that these things pointed to one who was to come. And that is the one we should trust in. They thought that they could trust in the sacrifices themselves and in the keeping of the Sabbath and the laws. For the pagans, it would include many things, many horrible things, like child sacrifice, which Israel became involved in, and Judah, where they would offer their children as sacrifices to the pagan gods. That was involved in it, as well as things that were not so horrible, like, as I said, the worship of the sun, moon, and stars. 
they dealing with persons who had a familiar spirit. They, the, the, what we now call, or what I now call horror scope. And some of you listen to it daily. And you don't know you are involved in witchcraft. That's what it is. It is. It is deep witchcraft, actually. It just sounds very nice, and the person who reads it, reads it so nicely. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you something. Do you believe, do you believe that the devil is going to walk up to anybody and say to them, Hello, I am the devil. Would you like to come to hell with me? And many of us are involved in these elementary principles. Some of them have been introduced lately with new nice sounding names. They are demonic at their core, but because of the injustice in society, they exert an influence on well-thinking people, including some Christians who don't take the time to study the origins of these movements and what they really intend to do. Have you ever done any reading on Planned Parenthood? Elementary principles. And these have come into the church in different ways. Legalism is perhaps the most pervasive way. Don't touch, don't taste, don't handle. Antinomianism is another big way. Lawlessness. Live anywhere you want to live. It doesn't matter. This belief that somehow we can usher in the kingdom of God through politics. Wearsby explains that, and I quote, no matter how wealthy a father may be, his infant son or toddling child cannot really enjoy that wealth. In the Roman world, the children of wealthy people were cared for by slaves. No matter who his father was, the child was still a child under the supervision of a servant. In fact, the child himself was not much different from the servant who guarded him. The servant was commanded by the master of the house, and the child was commanded by the servant. This was the spiritual condition of the Jews under the age of the law. The law, you recall, was the guardian that disciplined the nation and prepared the people for the coming of Christ. Galatians 3, 23 to 25. So when the Judaizers led the Galatians back into legalism, they were leading them not only into religious bondage, but also into moral and spiritual infancy and immaturity. 
Paul states that the Jews were like little children in bondage to the elements of the world. This word elements means the basic principles, the ABCs. For 15 centuries, Israel had been in kindergarten and grade school, learning their spiritual ABCs so that they would be ready when Christ would come. Then they would get the full revelation for Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 22 to 13. You know that the first Greek letter is Alpha, and the last Greek letter is Omega. So Jesus Christ is the entire alphabet. So if you have Jesus Christ, you don't need the ABCs, for you have the whole alphabet. If you have Jesus Christ, you don't need the law. He encompasses all the alphabet of God's revelation to man. He's God's last word, Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. Legalism then is not a step toward maturity. It is a step back into childhood. The law was not God's final revelation. It was but the preparation for that final revelation in Christ. It is important that a person knew, know his ABCs because they are the foundation for understanding all of the language. But the man who sits in a library and recites the ABCs instead of reading the great literature that is around him is showing that he's immature and ignorant, not mature and wise. Under the law, the Jews were children in bondage, not sons enjoying liberty. It is of adult sons, not of minor children, that Paul writes in Romans 8.14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. In a practical sense, we can look at it in that way. Every person who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit is now a son of God. But it is those who are led by the Spirit who show in a practical way that they are indeed the sons of God. Positionally, every believer is a son of God, not a child, a son of God. But practically, many of us are living as children, not as adult sons. But those who are led by the Spirit of God are the practical sons of God. They are not just sons positionally, but they are sons practically. William Noel, in his commentary on these verses, writes the following. Sons means adult sons, sons come of age. The term when referring to saints is applied in Paul's epistles both to Christ and to those associated with him since his resurrection, therefore to his own saints sealed by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit does not refer here to service nor to guidance in particular paths. So it's not talking about me talking to six young ladies and then going to the Lord and say, Lord, give me a sign which one I should marry for I love all six. That's not what it means. It refers to that general control by the blessed spirit of those born of the spirit, living by the spirit, in the spirit, the general control. Not that you just call upon God at a moment's notice and say, Holy Spirit, tell me which hat I must buy. 
and you're not living for God at all. You don't pay no attention to the Holy Spirit, but now you are in trouble. You just say, Lord, I want to buy a dress. When I go into the store, the first dress I say, let the Holy Spirit tell me that that is the one. Madness that I obey that. Use your use, God. Take where I take God for precky. Tell the person beside you, stop it. We're talking about the general control of the Holy Spirit. Who is controlling our entire lives. He is given precedence in our lives. We are yielding to him consistently. He, the Holy Spirit, is the sphere and mode of their being and is their seal unto the day of redemption. Israel received a spirit of bondage when they were placed under the law. And how sad, this is what I'm talking about. William Newell says, how sad that perhaps the most of Christians regard themselves as under the law and so under bondage. The most of Christians. Some of us sitting right here today are still governing ourselves by rules. We have never understood what it means to be led by the Spirit. We talk about it, but we have no clue what that means. We don't experience the Holy Spirit saying to us before we utter a word, don't say that. There's no need for you to say that. We don't experience the Holy Spirit saying, I don't want you to go there today. I want you to do this today. You don't experience that. What you experience is tongues when the light goes out. We don't understand what it is to be led of the Spirit. To be controlled by the Spirit. What we want to do is to use the Holy Spirit like how we use the Obia man. The Holy Spirit becomes our Obia man. So when Israel received the law, they received a spirit of bondage. In verse 15, Paul writes, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This is a personal relationship. Abba is an intimate term. Abba is a familial term. Old time Jamaicans used to call their father Papa. Papa or Daddy is not just father. It's more intimate than that. That's the spirit that we have. So why are we living like slaves? Why are we living in bondage? Why are we living in fear? Why are we putting rules over us?
What kind of spirit did you receive when you say you got it? When you got it. I, that it could be one of the problems, you know. A vast majority of people have got it and they didn't receive him. Is it your God? What kind of spirit did we receive? So in Col Colossians 2, 6 to 23, which is one of my go-to passages, Paul kind of sets out what should be normative for a Christian, a believer in Christ. This is how we're going to end. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, how did these people get saved? They accepted Christ Jesus as Lord. That's what they did. That's all you have to do to be saved. Paul says, just as you accepted Christ Jesus, Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. That's very important, brethren. Very important. Just as you accepted him, the struggle we have is that we never just accept him, many of us. That's a problem that some of us have. We didn't just accept him. But Paul says, if, if all you had to do was believe in him in order to be saved, then all you have to do to live for him is to believe in him. Nobody put them rule here upon yourself. God, that's not what you had to do in order to get saved. Let your roots grow down into him. And let your lives be built on him. Let your roots grow down into him. Christ. And let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Jesus did not say come unto the church. All you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, come unto me. He didn't say, come unto this denomination, or this organization, or this pastor, or this apostle, or this prelate. Come unto me. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies. Watch this now. And high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers. Stoichion. Elementary principles. That's what that word spiritual powers is. That's, that's the Greek. Spiritual powers. Spiky and some people love to talk about their spiritual powers. And some of you are involved with them every morning at the prayer line. And you don't know it. Spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. One day they're going to get me for all of this. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ. This is not a oneness passage. It's not a oneness verse. Paul didn't have that on his mind. What Paul had on his mind is that I want you all to understand that you don't need anything else else but Christ nothing else you are complete in Christ so all these other things that are being 
hold to you that you must observe. Where did they come from? You are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life. Not because you were baptized. Because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holidays or holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. I am not so bright, you know. But even though I am not so bright, I know that I can hold on to a shadow. It's not. Intelligence let me know that, you know, is because as a child, I used to try and catch my shadow and I couldn't do it. So if I have the reality who is Christ, why would I still be chasing after shadows? Do you understand that, brothers and sisters? If you have Christ, why? Well, let, let us see what Paul says. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels. I'm hearing preachers now saying, I will call upon my angel. What? And some of you listening to them, you know. Saying they have had visions about these things. You think Paul did fool like us? Paul said their sinful minds have made them proud. When I hear them, I know that's what Paul is talking about. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments. And it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ. And he has set you free from the stoichion of the world. Spiritual powers, you have been set free. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise, because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. In other words, they cater to what? The flesh. That's right, Sister Simone, the flesh. The flesh loves that. The flesh loves that. 
pious self-denial, strong devotion, and severe bodily discipline. You know, I was on a 40-day fast the other day. If you were on a 40-day fast the other day, that should have, the first thing that 40 day fast should have told you is that that is not anything to tell anybody about. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. So let me ask us something, brethren. Let me ask us something. Who you would prefer to believe? The spiritual gurus that you listen to or the Apostle Paul? Who, who, who are you going to listen to? Put aside Bartlett, for we already know that he's a fool and doesn't know what he's saying. But I think Paul knows what he's saying. Let's start. Our God and our Father, here we are. Lord, Forgive us because we have consistently lived below our privilege. We are sons, adult sons. Your spirit who indwells us when he came to indwell us, We cried, Abba, Father. That was his cry within us. We became your adult sons at that moment. But Lord, we have been living as if we are still children. We are not just the ears of God and the joint ears with Christ. Because children can be ears, but we are adult sons. So all that belongs to Christ is ours. So forgive us, Lord, for living below our privilege, for living in bondage, for living in fear for living in constant apprehension, for having no assurance of salvation, for living as if we were still helpless and hopeless. Lord God, we ask you to open our understanding that we may see that we are your adult sons. We are partners in the business. You have made us partners. You have adopted us. You have strategically done this. Help us, Lord, to learn to be led by your spirit, to be controlled by your spirit. We know, Lord, that the way that this is accomplished is by us letting the word of God dwell in us richly. So, Lord, give us a desire for your word a hunger and thirst for your word, to read it, to hear it, 
to rejoice, to be excited, to be delighted when we hear it divided in a right way. Our God and our Father, help us to set our affections on you. Help us, Lord, not to be fascinated by rules and regulations. The commandments in your word are enough for us. We are not without our guidelines. There are commands in Scripture. Some of us, Lord, are more concerned with the length of dresses than we are about loving our neighbors as ourselves. We talk more about these standards than we do about what is written in the Bible. You have told us that it is by this that we will be known as your disciples if we have loved one toward another. But we don't discuss these things. This is not what we discuss. We never sit down at length and talk about how should we love each other. We talk about who should wear a hat. And this is what we fight over. Children, immature, lacking intelligence, simple-minded. It is enough for us, Lord, what your word commands us to do and not to do. Let that be what we talk about. You have said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And you said there's a second that is as important. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Lord, you said that it is on these two commandments that all the others hang. So if we are able to do these two, we don't have to worry about anything else. But we are worried about everything other than these. Your church doesn't talk about these two, Lord. They talk about some things that are not even in the Bible. And some of us inside the building here are guilty of it this evening, Lord. And some listening to us this evening are guilty of it. Forgive us, Lord, and help us reorder our priorities and help us not only to be in the position of adult sons, but to live like adult sons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.